In today's episode, we brought in 10 different rappers and we're going to decide what's their best and worst album. The first time we did this, you guys absolutely loved it, so we thought it was fitting to bring it back. And if you guys are new to NFR Podcast, smash that subscribe button and smash the like button if you like this video. So let's start off with Travis Scott. So you ended up putting out a tweet, uh couple of months ago more or less yeah. talking about how you think utopia is his worst studio album quote unquote so I, well, does that yeah. does that claim so, stick you know what i had said was that utopia might be travis scott's worst album and yet it's still incredible and i think that's just like the bottom line with travis's catalog is that every project feels like a level up it feels different it feels unique and with more and more time, I feel like Birds in the Trap sing McKnight is probably going to be my answer for his worst album. I think that Utopia has some of Travis's best rapping. I think that even conceptually, it's a bit richer than Birds. Um, but both of them, honestly, if I'm looking like for how many songs I leave out of the mix when I'm listening to the albums, maybe a couple more skips on Utopia for me. But ultimately, I want to go Birds in the Trap sing McKnight is his worst. What about you? I'm going to agree with you. I had that take since I heard Utopia. I knew right away just based on all the types of different sounds he was providing. It's his most rich album when it comes to rapping, one of his best developed albums when it does come to rapping. And I also think that you have some of his biggest highs in his catalog in their example, um, like a My Eyes or a Schizo, for example. Thank so, God. Exactly. So you do have those types of tracks. Um, as you guys might know, if you do watch the podcast, for his best, I still have Astral as his lock for me. Um, um, some of his most iconic tracks within that track list. Um, I feel like the cohesiveness of the track list is absolutely incredible. The sequencing is on a completely different level. Production is incredible. I'm going to go with Astro. I have Rodeo still as his best, his debut album. I think it was one of the most innovative trap albums we've ever seen. And it's just aged like fine wine. It being Travis's oldest album, I feel like just the aesthetic of that album, the Mike Dean production, um, and just the experimentation on songs like Piss on Your Grave, Travis showed that his his sound and his artistry has no bounds with that album and I feel like that set the precedent for every album that followed it afterwards so that's the best for me next up that we have Kendrick Lamar and listen I don't want to spend too much time on what his best album is because we've had this conversation quite a bit I have good kid Matt City I have to pimp a butterfly but what's his worst because Mr. Morale and the Big Steppers is definitely his least accessible album to me although I do think that it is masterful in its own way I'm um, looking at songs like Count Me Out, looking at songs like Father Time, Mother I Sober. You are getting some of the best written Kendrick tracks ever. I will agree with you. And it comes down to Section 8 or Mr. Morale. It does. I'm not going to have Dam in this conversation. No. I think that's automatically discluded. Um, the way that I came down to Section 80, and it's going to be Section 80 for me, is because I do feel like, yes, with Section 80, you have some of his best ever rapping performances, in my opinion. Example, like a rigor mortis, like a high power. Um, like a man's dream. Exactly. Ronald Reagan era. You do have those types of tracks. I just do think that when you look at the overall track list, the evolution of Kendrick Lamar on Mr. Morale and the Big Steppers was at full execution. The sequencing was really nice. Yes, you do have certain songs that I don't revisit all that much, but for the most part, there was a beautiful concept behind this double-sided album. And I think that that's where I get the value out of Mr. Morale and the Big Steppers is that conceptual prowess. So I'm going to go with Section 80 being his worst, but still Section 80 is one of my favorite projects of the 2010s. They're on a similar playing field for me in the sense that like with Mr. Morale, I'll be honest, I'm, I'm not really checking out for that album all that much. I'm not revisiting it um, whatsoever, to be honest with you, as of right now. Although I do appreciate everything it stands for. But when you look at Section 80, it just feels like a stepping stone into Good Kid Mad City. It feels like Good Kid Mad City was the full idea he was trying to grasp on Section 80. And even looking at like the lowest lows of that album, you do have Tammy's song on there. You do have No Makeup. Um, and it just it felt like Kendrick was still trying to find his sound on that album. And I feel like for that reason, it is probably his worst project. But still, a still, classic. A fucking yeah, classic, bro. Yeah, kidding yeah, me? You can't, that's just, again... Blow my high, the hook on that. Like, Absolutely. Oh, my goodness. E even Chapter 10, one of my favorite interludes within his entire catalog. So you do have certain um, songs on there that do stand the test of time. But let's continue going on with this. Let's go on to Tyler, the Creator. So where do you want to start? Best or worst? Where do you want to go? Um, Let's start off with the best because um, I think the last time we spoke... You had said, call me if you get lost. And I feel like that's an original answer just because a lot of people will say Flower Boy or Igor. So do you still stand with that? I think it's his best rapping performance, if but that makes sense. That's not the question, okay, but I, I know. Don't interrupt me. I'm going to get there. So when I look back at his catalog and I really have to say, like, okay, pound for pound, what's his best studio album? 
I feel like, yes, you're going to go into that three-album run, right? And example, Call Me If You Get Lost, if you're more into Tyler's rapping and the, the heavy-centric rap focus, you're going to go there. Let's say you want something that's a bit more alternative, something with that Neo Soul sort of presence, you're going to go with Igor. I feel like the best of those worlds, though, do lie within Flower Boy, and for that reason, I think I'm going to go Flower Boy. I've had a massive revelation with this album. It's always been in my rotation, but example, like... Going back to songs like November or even Forward or even like 9-11, I'm going through these tracks and I'm listening to the writing, I'm listening to the production choices and it's the best on both fronts for Tyler in my opinion. I also feel like it was kind of like that grand entrance where it put him into a completely different league, kind of like Kendrick's Good Kid Mad City or let's say Travis's Rodeo for example, so... For that reason, I do think Flower Boy is his best, and I wouldn't be mad if you go with a Call Me If You Get Lost or an Igor. Yeah, I definitely have Igor here, and I think that although, yes, you will find better rapping performances on Flower Boy or Call Me If You Get Lost, because that was sort of the point of those albums, was to have more of those rap-centric performances, you still have songs like New Magic One and What's Good, where you're getting some of Tyler's best raps um, with the, the, the distortion in the background, and I feel like... Igor is a flawless album from start to finish. Even narratively speaking, I feel like it's a bit tighter than Flower Boy or Call Me If You Get Lost. Yes, I do feel that, but I just do feel like you get a bit more out of Flower Boy I when disagree. it does come to narrative and writing, like going into, let's say, the second half of 9-11 and then going into Mr. Lonely. Just those transition points in writing, I feel as if, do offer you a bit more. Also, I feel like you're getting the most surprises out of, out of uh, Igor, looking at the way that he made Uzi sound um, on Igor's theme, even looking at just the way that he masterfully blended R&B, hip hop, funk, soul. Um, to me, this was Tyler at his best in terms of him being a pu being a puppeteer, in the sense of having full control, evoking certain emotions, and really immersing you into the album. That's his best for me. What about uh, what about the worst? I have Goblin. I have Goblin. I think so. Yeah, and it was interesting because I couldn't necessarily consider Bastard into this conversation just because it is his debut mixtape, and I do find Bastard a better project, if I'm Same. being honest with you. Um, then, I mean, if you want to have the conversation of, of Goblin, let's say, versus Wolf, Wolf is much better executed on a thematic basis. I feel like a lot of songs on that project have aged better. Um, then if you want to compare Cherry Bomb to this sort of mix... I like Cherry Bomb, and it gets a lot of flack. I do think you have certain songs in there that have aged as his poorest, but for the most part, you're getting some of his best ever tracks, like a Smuckers in there. So ultimately, that's what led me going into Goblin. Yeah, and with Goblin, too, it felt like he was running in place. It felt like there was no evolution, really, from Bastard to Goblin, for me at least. And I do appreciate it because it was his breakout moment with Yonkers, and it was also the album that put him on the map, and it obviously has a role in that trilogy for the Wolf trilogy. So I appreciate that, but it's the least interesting production for me. Um, all the um, samples and the eerie synths sort of run their course at a certain point for me, and just the most boring Tyler performances of his entire career, and the, most re the, the least replayable tracks are all found on Goblin. Well... I kind of do disagree to a certain extent. You have a song like She on there. That's one of my favorite ever Tyler songs, at least for my rotation. I mean, you guys let me know in the cool. comment section. But okay, let's keep going on with this. Let's go into Denzel Curry. And I think this is going to be the first time on the podcast where we actually go into Denzel Curry's discography as a whole. One of the most underrated rappers um, from this generation, at least for you and I. And we've been a big fan of Denzel Curry because, at least for you and I, we've been able to see his evolution with every single studio album. So... As far as his worst goes, I think we'll start there with Denzel. I'm going to go with Zoo. I think that it's his worst album. Um, and it's not to say that it's a bad album. I actually think it's a great listen. It's just that it's a bit more free-flowing as far as the writing goes. It's not too concentrated. Um, it was kind of like paying homage to his hometown in Florida and kind of like encapsulating all of that. But when it comes to like song concepts, when it comes down to narratives within the album, the sequencing, I do feel like there are much better albums. Even Imperial you know, is much better than Zoo in my opinion opinion i think taboo is much better and i think melt my eyes is much better absolutely i think that zoo is his worst album and it's not a knock on denzel because i still love the listen there's songs like wish on there speedboat that i revisit quite frequently and i feel like it was just the approach he took with it it was looser he was having more fun with it he freestyled the entire album i think like, like that was actually needed for his career because if you look at that 2019 to 2020 denzel you get that and you get unlocked which are much more free-flowing projects with like those sort of like freestyle-esque performances. And just to add on to that, like this was on the heels of him just dropping Taboo where he had this big mainstream push and like I just love the idea that he's like, fuck it, I can collab with a bunch of huge artists and have a big industry-friendly album, but instead... I'm going to feature local Florida artists on here and pay homage back to my city that influenced me to become the artist that I was. I just, I loved everything it stood for. But again, 
his worst in comparison to the others, but what's his best? His best, I mean, I know where you're going with this just yeah. because I know how impactful this album is to you. And um I don't wanna deb- I don't wanna like sort of dispute that. I think that for every reason you having taboo as your best, it, it stands the test of time. Conceptually it's one of his best, but I'm gonna go with Melt My Eyes, see your future. I think what Melt My Eyes at least does for me, and it was my twenty twenty two album of the year, even looking now, like a year later after it's dropped and still being in my rotation. Um, the sequencing on the album is masterful, bro. Like That's it's great. it's a completely different league. I feel as if, in my opinion, the only thing I can maybe see like Taboo getting the edge over is the axe and how like that kind of follows suit with it. But I also think that you're getting Denzel Curry's best ever songs um in his career with songs like a Melt Session Number One with a Walk In, even something like The Last, for example. These song concepts are absolutely incredible from start to finish. Even the songs that I wasn't necessarily the biggest fan of, example like an X Wing, for example, I've gone back to these songs and i've grown a deep appreciation for them even something like an angels for example so for that reason i'm going melt my eyes i go taboo without a doubt i think it's his most theatrical album of course because of the three parts like you mentioned but even more than that it was the biggest statement that he ever made um giving commentary about the rap game as a whole and how um consumers sort of look at rappers like characters and they want to see them um, you know, almost kill themselves for their own entertainment to a certain degree. So I love how deep the messaging was. And I think it's also his most versatile album. When you're looking at um, songs like Black Metal Terrorist all the way to Black Balloons, hearing that that's coming from the same artist is mind-blowing to me. And I think that Denzel really put out his best conceptual piece with that project. And um, it checked every box for me. It still stands the test of time. So that's how I feel about Denzel's Taboo. I think that is his masterpiece. But Mel My Eyes, of course, is also incredible and has better production. I'll give it that over Taboo. But next up, we got Juice World, Best and Worst. Obviously, a bit of a shorter catalog here. Um, two of the albums being posthumous albums with Legends Never Die and Fighting Demons. So where do you want to start, Best or Worst? Um, we'll start with the worst, and I think this isn't going to come as no surprise. I think the worst in his catalog is definitely Fighting Demons, and even from a posthumous release, right? You have to look at that whole situation, and you're like, well, Jules World was not here for the creation of that, maybe, and there were certain decisions that were made, but at least with Legends Never Die, there was a cohesive feel to this project. There was a vision that was executed behind it, and there was these monumental tracks for his career that ended up releasing posthumously, and I do feel like it is one of the strongest projects within his catalog, but with Fighting Demons... For the most part, I do feel like it was a forced release. I do feel like when you go through the track list, you could feel like they're kind of scraping for verses to a certain extent. The production choices and the curation choices don't even match the verses that are going down. Uh, I just, I go back to that album so rarely that, I mean, it's easily one of his most forgettable projects at that. And um, again... I just, I don't necessarily think it stands a test of time. I'll be honest, when it comes to Juice's catalog, I feel like every album since Goodbye and Good Riddance has been following in its footsteps, trying to replicate that same original magic in terms of themes, in terms of sound, and no other album has ever reached that level for me, but um, it's obviously Fighting Demons as his worst, and I feel like, it's not like every song sounds like a demo, where it's like, oh, this is a half-baked song. It's more the fact that these songs come together and are glued together so randomly there's, yeah. there's, there's no connection from one song to the next the curation also, choices were so forced yeah and even looking at like highlights i think of a song like burn with metro boomin um that was a really cool collaboration to see take shape but even looking at something like um from my window which is a highlight and there's aspects i like about it but even that being a highlight there's weak writing on it there's- so even like the best of the best on the album leave you wanting more and it did feel like it was a bit forced to put that album out. Yeah, on. he's listen, he's one of the biggest what ifs in hip hop because imagine he would have had the time to be able to develop his catalog. And mm-hmm. okay, after Legends Never Die, because apparently he did have time to be able to develop that before he passed Somewhat, away. Somewhat, yeah. He would have been able to build off of that and gone into a completely different direction. But as his best, I mean, listen, man, it's good buying good riddance. I mean, easy. Um, this is a big album for a lot of the new generation listeners, and I can't blame them. I'm being completely honest with you. I mean, even though I'm not the one that's the most invested into Juice World's catalog, like you have to respect this album. There's a crazy narrative that goes all the way through about love and the concept of love and you know the different stages of grief with love. And it's just so well done when even it comes to a personal aspect. You have some of his best ever songs on here. It's just, it's brilliant. I'm being completely honest. Yeah, like with songs you. like Hurt Me, All Girls Are the Same, um, I'll Be Fine. Those are some of the best in his catalog without a doubt. And I just love that he told a story about a break. Up that tore him to shreds 
It was so cinematic. I love the skits as well that really added to the overall story arc of the project. Um, apart from that, I just feel like he brought his A game in terms of oh, melodies, yes, of course. hooks, beat selection. The way the album flows. There was a certain cohesiveness that rings off through that studio album that makes you get really personal with it. And I think a lot of listeners could agree with this. Goodbye and Good Riddance probably served them um, in such a special way when listening to it because there's a big relatability factor to the track list. And I think that's what people love about Juice World's music. So it's easily his best without and yeah, a And even in terms of like being a benchmark for emo rap, I think that this album is... Uh, is very important for the genre and was for Juice World. But next up, let's go into the Migos, okay? And this is interesting because most of their catalog comp uh, comprises of more mixtapes than studio albums. So in, in terms of studio albums, I believe you have The Three Cultures and, and YRN from 2015. Yeah, Young Rich Nation. Um, so speaking about the best, let's talk about culture. Yeah. Um, to me, this was a game changer. There was trap music before culture came out. And after culture came out, in terms of just the impact of the triplet flows, the ad libs, um, just the energy that they brought to the table, um, the way that they were all in sync with each other, um, feeding off of each other on every single song. And not only do you have memorable bangers like T shirt, like Bad and Bougie, like Slippery, but even the deep cuts are fucking amazing. Looking at Brown Paper Bag or Get Right Witcha, What the Price. Um, this is the Migos at their peak. Not a single second wasted on the project. Yes, maybe you have a song or two, um, like All Ass, that you're maybe not a fan of. I kind of like every song on here to varying degrees, obviously, but... Um, this anthem was, after Anthem. You can't, what it, how, what's the nitpick with this project? And yes, well, I do not necessarily enjoy a song like All Ass. I mean, fuck it. When there's like a slippery on here, a Get Right Witch, you, you know, a t-shirt. Just so many iconic songs for that time. And like you said, there's trap music before culture and after culture. And easily one of their most concise projects. As far as their worst goes, because this is up for debate. I mean, um, I'm not going Young Rich Nation. I'm being completely honest with you. It's actually a focused track list. It's, it's pretty probably, good. Yeah, it's actually a good listen. And you have some of like their best ever songs on here, like a Cocaina with Young Thug. Yes, sir. What a stupid banger. That was crazy. And like, it's nice because this was like maybe the last project that you got before the culture era of Migos. So if you're really into that old classic Migos aesthetic, then this is the project for you. And I think that going into the studio album, you're going to get a lot of energy. You're going to get a lot of bombastic bars that feel like they're in your face and they're very brash. As far as their worst, I think it comes at no surprise. It is culture three. That was the debate for me though. Culture two or culture three no, because... Culture three. Culture 2 is a bit more bloated than Culture 3 in terms of, like, there's 24 fucking songs on there, but the highs are higher, ultimately. And even looking back at Culture 3, there's probably only five songs that I would really take out of there, which would be Avalanche, Modern Day, Straightening, um, uh, I think the other one's called Jane, where you have Take Off with, like, the brick and bag uh, yeah. uh, hook on there. That was pretty fire, too. But, um, Even Malibu with Polo G, that, that was, was not pretty, bad. That was pretty good as well. But for the most part, I was just kind of left disappointed because it, it felt like they tried to do too much on the project. If that makes sense to you, a lot of the verses were just way too overextended, and like that doesn't necessarily do well for rotation. Like for the Migos, I'm not necessarily looking for this crazy concept. I'm not looking for the craziest verses. I want stuff that's gonna live with me. For example, I'm still going back to like YRN example or even a culture where grabbing those songs during my rotation i'm bumping them in the whip but with culture three there wasn't necessarily too much that i grabbed out of it and like you said for culture two there is big standouts example like a flooded crazy track monumental so culture three culture three without a doubt and i just think that you know when it came down to this album it's it seems like they were really trying to make it sell in terms of having the posthumous Pop Smoke and Juice World features in terms of the length of the track list, placing that Drake feature at the top of the track list as well. It just it felt a bit more calculated for sales rather than for art. Yeah. And to be honest with you, it it sounded like the same old Migos. You know what I mean? Besides a song like Avalanche, which had which had like that temptation sample mixed in with some 808s. That was one of the most like innovative trap songs in a minute, but that came a dime in a dozen within that project. There wasn't really that much evolution, and they didn't. The group dynamic wasn't the same for me personally. But let's keep on going. Speaking about another interesting catalog, we have DJ Khaled. Yeah, he's not a rapper, but I know Lou and I when we were talking about forming the episode, it was interesting because we actually never went through his studio albums and spoke to them at length. And 
I feel as if since we've opened the podcast, it's kind of always been a negative connotation when talking about his projects because he hasn't released his best efforts whatsoever in the past couple of years. Actually, I feel like his projects have been on a major decline, but there is some serious quality in his catalog. There is. There are some stupid studio albums here. So let's start with the best. Let's start on a positive note. You know, what do you have as the best? Um, To be honest with you, I feel like his most consistent albums would be Kiss the Ring from 2012. That's that was a that one. was a serious album, and then Suffering from Success as well. Not was bad another either, great, yeah. That was not bad as well. Um, honestly, Major Key is going to be the one for me, and I just yeah. because I think that when it came to that album, you're getting Khaled's best curation in terms of the artist that he's binding together. Um, for example, putting a Big Sean and a Kendrick Lamar in a Holy Key. That made for a great fucking song. Even if you're looking at um, Travis Scott and Lil Wayne on Tourist, for example, getting solo songs from Drake, J. Cole, and Nas, that was also really well calculated on his end. And I love this experience the most because this first half of the album is fucking stacked, bro. It is stacked. You literally yeah, have a run that goes... Um, hold on, let me pull it up real quick so I'm getting it exactly in the right order. Yeah, you have, I, got I Got the, the keys, keys for free, free Nas, Nas album, album done, done, Holy Key, key Jermaine's, Jermaine's Interlude. interlude. Wow. Um, and yeah, and obviously... Listen, is every song on here great? No. You also have, um, you know, the uh, the Megan Trainer song, Forgive Me Father, which is absolutely horrible. Um, I didn't like to pick these hoes apart with Kodak and, and Young Jeezy. So there's still a couple of misses. You're not, you're, like, the perfect Khaled album doesn't exist, guys. We have to get that into our heads. But what's cool about this project, too, is that it perfectly encapsulated what, like, 2016 hip-hop was like at that time and bringing the biggest and best players together for a studio album. And I feel like... That's something that you'd love to see from a DJ Khaled album. Even, I want to shout out We The Best Forever. This track list is so stacked, too. I was going through the track list again. Songs like I'm On One, Welcome To My Hood. Um, mm -hmm. You know, crazy stuff. You can't stop with Birdman and T-Pain. Just incredible tracks. And as far as his worst goes, this is absolutely DJ Khaled's worst ever track list. And that is Khaled Khaled for me. <laughs> there is no doubt this is a bad album from start to finish. I mean... Besides every chance I get with Lil Baby and Lil Durk, that is the only exception on here, yep. if I'm being completely honest with but you. But you do have the Drake throwaways, um, and I'm calling them throwaways because they're not necessarily bad songs, but you could have told that Drake was never going to be putting these on a studio but album. But let me just go through the curation choices, right? Because on a DJ Khaled album, you want to see the curation choices, and you want to see who's going to come together with who and deliver the best track. So, again, when I'm going on to a song like I Did It, with Post Malone, Megan the Stallion, Lil Baby and the Baby. That is a recipe for disaster. And that track has no place in my rotation, at least for me. Then you go into even something like This Is My Year with like A Boogie with the Hoodie, Big Sean, Rick Ross, and Puff Daddy. You know, you're left wanting more. Sorry, not sorry with Nas Jay Z and James Fauneroy. I mean, you you were you're apparently getting this massive collaboration again from Nas and Jay Z after so many years, and then it comes and it's just extremely underwhelming. So even at that, you know, you left wanting more there. Um, I just don't know where to go with it. To be I, honest, I, I with think you. that's just a testament to like where DJ Khaled's curation is at right now, where he's making funky soups. He's he's throwing some fruit in there, some veggies, some meat. He's just tossing it up, bro, and seeing what the fuck is gonna stick. And at the end of the day, um. Khaled Khaled is the worst example of that in terms of yeah. collaborations that don't make any sense and shouldn't even exist. We going crazy with her and the Migos. That was a bad song, too. That was really nasty when it came to my rotation. Like, never made my rotation once that um, track list ended up coming out. So, yeah, that's definitely his worst. But where else are we going, bro? What do we have next? Um, next up, we got Trippy Red, who has a very interesting catalog, too. And I feel like, um, let's go to his worst first. I feel like when it comes to Trippy's catalog, you did start to see the downfall in this decade, in the 2020s decade, mm -hmm. when you're looking at projects like Mansion Music, when you're looking at projects like Pegasus. But the beginning of it all, to me, was exclamation point from 2019. You think so? I, That's I, his worst. I, I still feel like that is his worst album. Um, it's a really awful listen from start to finish. And when it comes down to it, it's just... It's some of the goofiest music he's made. In term, like, listen to the first song on here the production um is awful also you have a, um, a random ass the game feature on one of these songs where he does this melodic ass crooning performance and you're like what am i getting out of this right like just because you're on a trippy album bro you, you don't you're not okay, that guy you see, because you're not I, that guy bro 
Sheesh, come on. Who's being harsh today? But no, I like but it's it. true. Like, it the the true. game is not the guy to give you an auto-crooning performance. But he's done it with Anderson Pock before, though. But it's more like no. melodic rapping a he's bit. He's rapping, though. He's not yeah, auto-crooning. He's... Anyways, exclamation point could definitely be considered. But for me, it's mansion music, man. That was, uh, that was a, a hot, slow burn. 25 songs. Man, you, you honestly, after like... I, I want to say after a cycle with future man this just goes all the way down if i'm being completely honest with you it's way too bloated and listen i understand because in the zane low interview he had spoken about how the leaks affected the release of this project and i understand that but when you call a spade a spade dude this album is too much it's just <laughs> like there is no way i am running this from start to finish again um there's legitimately almost no redeemable tracks at least for myself and my rotation on this besides mansion music and like atlantis with chief keef those are the only two songs you're getting out of a 25 song project so what are you really getting and i'm happy that a love letter to you five did release this year to be able to have kind of like this bounce back that was a good album to me but the a love letter to you series is a mixtape series so that can't be considered into this conversation yeah. At the end of the day, I just feel like Trippy's at his best when he's really putting everything on full display, where he has the emo melodic singing, he has um, more of that fun rapping style, like we saw with the track he put out with Wayne this year. Um, just giving us a good mixture of everything, mixture of everything essentially, and that takes me to what I think his best album is, which is going to be Life's a Trip from oh, 2018. No doubt about but it. But a lot of people would have said A Love Letter to You, which I think is also... A pretty good but option, not, I, but I don't think that's con that's considered a studio album. That's it's true. Not, it's true. It might not be considered a like studio his album. best project. Let's say if you guys want to say is probably a love letter to you. No, I still go life's a trip, but it's life's a trip for me. You know, I feel like also Trippy came up in like that 2016, 2017 era, and like this is maybe like the peak for him. And if I'm being completely honest with you, and there's just so much fire stuff on here, man. Like Dark Knight, Dumbo, Taking a Walk, uh, just incredible stuff. I mean, I'm not a fan of bird shit, if I'm being honest yeah, with you. Yeah, bird shit's not all that. But, but whatever. Mean, like, you know, you have a good time listening to this album. Like, going back to 2018, I loved having this in rotation. I was very interested in Trippy's career, and I'm still going back to at this. At the end of the day, I'm, just, I'm looking at, like, the hits to, to, to misses ratio, and this has the best ratio out of all his albums. I think it's his most colorful invigorating album looking at songs like Oom's Revenge you're getting one of his most introspective songs ever looking at Taking a Walk Dark Knight Dummo songs like Wish you're getting absolute hitters some of the biggest songs of his career for big um, releases and uh, at the end of the day like I said you get that perfect mixture of seeing all of what Trippy could offer as an artist on that album so. that's very true but okay let's keep going on with this let's go into Lil Yachty um, Lil Yachty has a very interesting catalog especially the way that it's divided because um, the first Lil Boat is considered a mixtape so that has to be out of here um, if you like more of his Michigan boy flows that's considered a mixtape as well so that can be brought into the conversation for his best studio album I think it's going to come as no surprise for you and I I still think it's let's start here um, it was probably one of his least successful uh, projects when it comes to commercial success but then again I do feel like it is the project that redefined him as an artist it got people intrigued even more into Lil Yachty's artistry he feels very proud about the project it's a great turn for him I think it's a good album and I think that you are getting some of his best ever songs um, like example like a running out of time example or Black you know, Seminole. Seminole so I, I would go that as his best right? Absolutely I think he made a great album and he showed people that if he really wants to he can craft a body of work with actual intention and i also feel like what amazed me about this album is that every single leap that he took paid off when it came to him venturing into funk and r&b with diana gordon on a song like drive me crazy or him doing the vibrating poland vocals on a song like pretty every choice that he made ended up paying off for me so I, it, it's a great fucking listen from start to finish i love that he swapped out the more bubblegum rapping for some nice mellow singing on the project as well but let me ask you this if Lil Boat was in consideration here, would that have trumped no, Let's Start Here? No, I think okay. it's much more impressive as a studio album, okay. to be honest with you. But going on to his worst, um, I didn't want to go with Lil Boat 2 just because no. I do feel like there is quality to that track list somewhat. It's still not my favorite. Um, even Nothing to Prove or Lil Boat 3, like whatever, you know? it's Nothing not for to me. Prove is not good, though. It's not good. But I think easily his worst is Teenage Emotions <laughs> and... Man, he got torched for this album, bro. And it, honestly, it was awful, though. And honestly, it's for a good reason. I think that the reception around it is warranted just because 21 songs, legitimately nothing. Like, well, Absolutely besides nothing. maybe Peekaboo. But, but even, even if you at look that, at Peekaboo, bro, like, she blow the dick like a cello? Like, 
play with that kitty like hello like come on bro like it's, it's some of the cringiest fucking lines you'll it's ever too hear it's bubble gum like it's too plastic that's what the track list feels like so I, I, I don't wish anyone to listen to this as a full experience it's 21 songs and listen 21 is hard for anyone to keep consistent and maintain quality but for Yachty at that point in his career I don't think he was up for the challenge I will whatsoever. say this, though. Congratulations to Yachty for being able to bounce back from this studio album. I think, like, after this, he probably knew that he had to go into a different direction and probably start experimenting a bit more because this was, like, all of, the, all of like, the things that probably went right with Lil Boat but just hyper-focused and just bloated in a 21-song track list. It, just, it felt like he sort of uh, planned for it to be a meaningful album, but it really ended up having no vision. And songs like Harley will give you an absolute migraine. I'm telling you now. Listen to his vocal shrieking on there. Oh, my goodness. That's what I'm saying, though. Awful. So, um, okay. So let's Shout out to Yachty, though, because the evolution's been beautiful. Um, we got one more artist to go to today, and it's an artist that has one of the most underrated catalogs in hip-hop history for me. I was going me. through his studio album catalog, and it's actually stupid. It's so hard to choose his worst on here. I'm being completely honest It really with is. You. So let's start with the best, because I think that an easy place to, to turn to is obviously his work with The Alchemist, because you have my first chemistry set, you have The Price Price of Tea in, in China, China, and Bo Jackson. And Bo Jackson. So is, is that where your answer is going to lie? Because I, wanted to I was say, struggling. I, I was struggling, okay? And I didn't actually, you know, until now, I still, at the time of this recording, while we're recording this, I'm not decided. I am not I know, decided. Bro. I'm between Bo Jackson and Mangra McNichols. That is legitimately my one-two split. I feel I like think, Bo Jackson's my most played album. It's the one I have the yes, most fun, fun with. with. I feel like there's probably the most memorable tracks on there from his catalog. Um, but if you want to call a spade a spade... Manger on McNichols, McNichols is the best. No doubt about that it. Just, it's, it's a perfect album. Yeah, it really um, it gave you a window into like the murkiest side of Detroit and what someone's life is like um, when they're living um, in, in the ghetto of Detroit. And just the messages, the topics of like prison reform and just these subjects that are not often brought up in hip hop and just the pen that he brought to that, the job that Sterling Tolls did on the production. Detroit River Rock is an all-time great song from this decade. Absolutely. Even um, the middle of next month, Goth Flick, yeah, the I'm outro. like crazy. Some of the best writing, some of the most incredible jazz infused with hip-hop. Um, a lot of people put it next to To Pippa Butterfly for being like the best produced albums in hip-hop in recent time, and I could see why they would... Um, put it on that front that's why like when it comes to lyricism and concept and when it comes down to production this is the perfect balance of both and they play equally with each other and yes i do think that boldy james is an incredible rapper i do think that his work with the alchemist is top tier it's probably the stuff that makes my rotation the most but like you were saying you know what he did with sterling tolls on this album is magical it's generational and it's easily one of the most underrated rap albums of our time if i'm being completely honest absolutely but let's go into his worst here and this is a bitch to give an answer for just because the guy doesn't make bad music like that. Okay, so what were you considering? What was I considering? I was considering um, what would end up being the most uneventful Boldy James album for me. And I'm not sure if everyone's going to accept this answer because some people consider this an album, other people don't. But the Versace tape, I think, is probably his weakest project because some people consider it a tape, but other people have called it his Griselda album debut because it was his first um, album he put out after signing with Griselda. It was fully produced by Jay Versace. And the reason why I think it's his worst is for the sole fact that when I look at it, um, you're getting, of course, Boldy's usual nonchalant monotone delivery throughout it, but... It's being paired up with a lot of similar sounding soul vocal samples and lo-fi instrumentation. And it just becomes the most uneventful soundscape. And it sounds a bit dull. Okay, as because an technically I'm looking at I'm looking at Wikipedia right now for the discography split. Um, it's considered a mixtape. So if it's technically considered a mixtape, what would you go for the studio album? For the studio album, okay, let's go check out um, what it is. What, what do you have though? I was considering Indiana Jones that ended up dropping yeah. this year with Rich Gaines. I mean, it's not a bad project or even a mid project at that. It's a good listen. It's just it's a bit predictable for Boldy James, in my opinion, if I'm being completely honest with you guys. And um, I do think that when you have to look at a Tecmo Bowl or a Killing Nothing or a Fair Exchange No Robbery, um, I love what he's doing with those part with those producers in particular. Whereas if with this, just 
it's a bit it's a bit bland if yeah. I'm completely honest. I'll be honest. I haven't really like I, I think I listened to it once a bit loosely in the I Indiana gave it a Jones couple of listens because I wasn't yeah. I wasn't huge on it, so I'm like I don't feel like revisiting it to be honest. But um Real Bad Boldy is another one that I'm not too huge on. I think that um the production straight away from like Boldy's typical soundscape and um I don't feel like it was the best marriage between the beats that you got compared to what Boldy was. Uh, I was will delivering. say, okay, so for myself, I'm going to go with Indiana Jones as what I think is his worst studio album, quote unquote. Still a good listen, though. Give it a listen and let me know how you like it. But as far as an underrated one for you guys, please, guys, go into Fair Exchange No Robbery oh, with yes. Nick Craven. Um, this is crazy because Nick Craven is one of the best sample flippers in the entire industry. Um, these drumless beats that just. Had so much luxury and eloquence to a track list, then it's perfect Bro, for a He'll Boldy find Jeans. five seconds of a vocal sample, loop it, and make it sound interesting and spin it different ways as the song progresses. And he's really a mastermind when it comes um, to his sample flips, like you were saying. But shout out to Boldy James, one of the best doing it right now. Um, some people can call him the MVP of this decade. And I couldn't blink an eye at that, to be honest. He's with really you. like the underground king, in my opinion. He is. And he he's is. Not, I don't even know if he's underground at this point anymore just because of the massive fan base that he's um, collected over the past couple of years. So how do you guys feel about our selections? Um, who should we do next if we do do a part three to this series? And guys, thank you so much for the recent support on the recent YouTube videos. We love you guys. And if you guys are not subscribed to NFR Podcast yet, please hit that subscribe button. We are forever grateful for you guys being here and supporting us. And we'll catch you in the next video. Peace.